God is good. All the time. And all the time. God is good. And that transcends anything that's going to happen, okay? That's bigger. But, uh, but it's always good to keep that balance of we are citizens of heaven, but we live out our lives here in this world for Jesus. So, so let's do that with our eyes on him. And uh, in that spirit, I want to invite you to go ahead and open up your bulletin if you're with us in the room or if you're online, grab something you can write on, uh, take some notes, because we are going to dive into a new series today called All In. And uh, if you know anything about me, this kind of stuff just really just uh, jacks me up. I get excited. I, I don't think there's really any other way to live for Jesus other than full throttle. I just, that's just my nature, okay? And uh, it's so funny, as Ashley, as you were reading Ephesians chapter 1 there to us, just a little nerdy insight into that first chapter. <laughs> if you know anything about Paul, first off, understand parchment isn't like something they just pull off the shelf like they have stacks of, okay? This stuff was not super easy to come by. That's what they wrote on. So, so they were very careful about what they put ink to because you couldn't just you know, go backwards like we do on our computer or whatever. It was there once you put it there. But those first 14 verses that, that Ashley read for us there at the beginning, when you, when you study it, it's a run-on sentence. It's like a four-year-old. Have you ever talked to a four-year-old about their life? And they're like, oh, this, and then this, and then this, and run, hmm, hmm, and there's no comma, there's no period or anything. And, and Paul, in those first 14 verses, he's just overwhelmed with how good God is. And what he's done. And it's like his pen just won't stop. Just saying, and this, and this, and he's so good, and he's awesome, and this, and that. It's just great. And that's the spirit that we want to kind of tap into as we go into this series all in. I really hope this is going to encourage you as we go through this month and we think about living for Jesus every day. In 1519... There was a fellow named Hernando Cortez. You may have heard of this fellow. He was a Spanish conquistador, and he was charged with the mission of conquering the Aztec Empire. Who, who, the Aztecs lived in what is modern-day Mexico. And so he set off on this mission from Spain in 1519 and landed on the shores of what is modern-day Mexico. And upon going ashore, he famously gave the order to all of his men to burn the ships that were anchored just offshore, which sent a pretty clear message. We're not going back, right? There is no retreat. There is no plan B. We're all in, right? It's forward, period, only option. And uh, you know, regardless of what you think of Cortez, that notion is powerful. And I want you to think this morning about the reality that as you journey through life and you come into contact with the reality of the gospel, that Jesus is God's son, that we are sinners, that the cross is God's solution for that, and that our choosing and receiving him, that is a burn the ships moment when we step into a decision to follow Jesus. There's no going back, right? I often think about Peter. There was a moment when Jesus is teaching, and sometimes he said some hard things. And the gospel would say, that, you know, there were many crowds following him, but after he said this, many turned away and did not follow him anymore. It was like Jesus periodically would draw a line in the sand and say, if you want to be my disciple, we're going to look at one of those in just a moment, uh, you've got to do this. And many would turn away. And at one point he said to Peter, are you going to leave also? And Peter, he didn't know anything about Cortez, but he got this point. He said, where are we going to go? You hold the words of eternal life. There is no option B. There is no other Savior. It is Jesus, all or nothing. And, um, and so that's, I just want us to think about that as we talk and walk through this together. In Luke chapter 9, verses, uh, or verse 23, Jesus lays out one of these statements for us. Luke says, Jesus said to them all, Whoever wants to be my disciple, whoever wants to step into this new life of following me as Lord must deny themselves. First step of Christianity, it's not about you. That's like a big step. And that's a big deal because humans are kind of, our flesh is, is hardwired with, it's all about me. 
What do you mean? Everything that happens everywhere I go, I run it through the filter of, do I like it? <laughs> and if I don't, then I let people know about it. Right? Jesus said, no, 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 no. In this kingdom, it's not about you. So that's the first thing. And then, just to kind of add another layer to that, you must deny yourself and take up your cross, which the first century folks would have totally understood. Count yourself dead to this world. Count yourself dead to your old life. It's really like doubly not about you. <laughs> right? Uh, count yourself dead to your old life. You're stepping into a whole new life. And then, I love that Luke adds Jesus' word, Daily. How many of you at some point in your life have made a real commitment to Christ and it was just an incredible season and you said, I am all in with Jesus and then three weeks passed and you're like, oh, I, I got to get back there. I got to go back because I, I, I got to do it again, right? Because it kind of waned or it, like, like uh, Ashley was mentioning, you know, the eyes of our, our heart kind of got a little cloudy and, and we lost sight and we got to continue to refresh. And I love that Jesus says, hey, this isn't just a one and done. This is an every day. You wake up, this is the day the Lord, the Lord, my Lord has made, and he is my Lord, and it's not about me. And as I slip out of bed this morning, I take up my cross and acknowledge that I don't live for this world, I live for Jesus. And then he says, and follow me. And you know, to follow Jesus means, like we said all last month, it means to fix, lock forever on, continually on your true north. That's what we said all last, last, last month, right? Jesus. Lock your eyes on him. Fix your eyes on him. You can't follow somebody and look somewhere else. You'll lose them. You gotta fix your eyes on him. You can't run ahead of them. If you run ahead of them, you're not leading, or they're not leading anymore. You are. Anybody ever struggle with kind of getting ahead of the Lord, right? No, no, no. Fix your eyes on him. Stay behind him. Let his time, let his leading, let his truth, let his word guide your steps. And then go where he follows, or follow where he leads. You can't say you're following the Lord when he leads you here and you go over there. Right? That's huge. And you're really not going to be able to do those three things unless you've died to yourself. Because self is always going to want to kind of do the other things. It's going to want to run ahead. Oh, I don't like over there. I want to go over here. Right? It's huge. This is, this is what it means to be all in for Jesus. Now, First off, let me congratulate um, Tennessee. You guys won big yesterday. Sorry, Scott. I'm sorry. I know you love Kentucky. Uh, but that was a good game. And how about Tech? I looked up the score. It's like 52 to 10. I don't know if you guys are aware, but we have a college or university down the road. And <laughs> they play football. And they won big. Well, you know, my team's Notre Dame. And, and before we got Coach Freeman, we had a fellow named Brian Kelly, and I like, kind of like to razz him sometimes, but he did some good things while he was uh, leading my team. And I remember a conference, a media conference that he had at one point, and they were talking to him about the quarterback, the performance of the quarterback, and how he could improve, how he could get better. And he said something I thought was really interesting. He said, he practices well. When, when we're walking through the schematics and executing the, the drills and doing the things, he, he's, 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 his execution is great. We've just got to help him carry it over to game time. Right? We've got to take that execution in the theoretical and flesh it out in the real. And I don't know about you, but there are seasons of my life when I'm a better theoretical Christian than I am a real one. I got it up here. I understand I could pass the test. But then when it gets to my attitude in this situation, my willingness to serve, my willingness to say it's not about me in these moments, I need some help. And praise God we have it. But I need some help carrying it over to real life, the game. Right? Living for Jesus. By the way, this is why we have the word send in our mission statement. It's... it's, it's kind of focused on, on the evangelistic aspect of being ambassadors, but it's also a reminder, and at the end of every service, we try to remind ourselves as we're leaving that this, this holy huddle that we've had today, which is a beautiful part of being a follower of Jesus, we've gathered, we've been encouraged, we've worshipped, we've celebrated, but now we're leaving, and we're going into the game, and we're going kind of beyond, if you will, the theoretical and into how do I live for Christ 
at work, in my family, in my neighborhood. And, and, and that's a lot of what we're going to kind of talk about in this series. In 1979, I was 12 years old, and I received the great honor of being named a Chesterfield All-Star. Now, that's Little League. Little League Baseball. That's a big deal when you're a kid. Okay? Now, this, little, this All-Star Series, this was, if you're, if you're a fan, if you know about these things, there's a World Series of Little League Baseball in Williamsport, Pennsylvania every year. And this, little, this All-Star team that I was part of was part of that tournament. We never got anywhere near Williamsport, okay? <laughs> but I was named an All-Star, and it was awesome because now all of a sudden all the guys who were the best players of all the teams came together on one team, and it was just a cool thing to go onto the practice field with those guys because I was like, man, I used to dread that guy because he was really good, and this guy was a really good pitcher. But now we're all on the same team, and it just felt really cool. And so as we were practicing for our first game against the Franklin All-Stars across, the, across town, uh, we were doing batting practice, and our coach, Tom Harvey, he was, a good, he was the father of a good friend of mine, Jay, and, and uh, Jay was on the team too, and he, he, he was pitching batting practice. And when Tom was pitching, man, I was loose. I had no worries, man. You know, I don't know if you know this, but 12-year-olds, they can throw the ball hard, but it's not always accurate. But Tom, man, he just threw it across the plate just consistently every time, and I was loose, man, and I got up there, smack over the fence smack over the fence just one after another i'm just like cranking them out of the park so much so that even though i was not that kind of hitter through the season they put me in the cleanup position now if you know anything about baseball that's the fourth batter that's the power hitter that's the guy that if you get two or three guys on base by the time he gets up he's gonna crank it over the fence yay right <laughs> so they put me in that position and the first game came up and it's not Tom pitching. It's this 12-year-old who's just wiry and he's throwing heat. Pew, pew. I mean, he's throwing, it's coming in there fast. And I stepped into the batter's box. And now it's not just us and friends and team on the playing, on the practice field. There's people and they're cheering and there's people and I feel all their eyes. And I'm not loose. I'm tight. And this little kid, man, he like... Pew throwing across the plate, and I, I, got, I got a hit. I got a base hit. But instead of whack, it was just I just kind of laid the bat out there and made contact and threw, hit a little blooper. Into, got a base hit. Yay. <laughs> but I remember in that moment feeling so disappointed because I had, at all this time, I was like, man, I've been entrusted with something here, and I just kind of choked. That's what I did. I choked. And uh, I, don't want, I didn't want to just hit home runs in practice. I wanted to hit home runs in the game. Right? Carry that into what we're talking about here. God has filled you. He is, he is with you. He has is, he is given you so much, everything you need. Uh, and we don't want to just hit home runs when we're in this theoretical kind of gathering, talking about God together with our friends who are in Christ. We want to hit home runs in, the, in, in our everyday life. That's what we're going to try, to try to really convey as we go through this, this series. And Paul gives us a great word on kind of how to engage in that process of moving that direction. In Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 through 16, I want to break this down. Listen to what Paul says. Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, as you have always Followed Jesus faithfully, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence. Listen to this. Continue to work out your salvation. Please understand, never think that Paul is saying work for your salvation. We are saved by grace through faith in Jesus. You can't work for it. I, I, I hope you really understand that. Paul, another way to say this is flesh out this gift that God has put inside of you. Flesh it out. Bring it from, from theoretical into real. Move past just talking about the Lord and understanding and belief, which are all important. 
but bring them to the place where your hands are, are pleasing to the Lord. And, and in other words, what, when Paul says, offer your bodies as living sacrifices, to the place where you're expressing your faith in your relationships and at work and everywhere you go, that you're living as an ambassador, right? Engage in that process of making the theoretical real so that it comes into to real life. And then he says, listen to this, these two words really, I, mean, I, I spent some time with these two words this week. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Dude, i got to be honest. There's times when I just read over that. I don't want to deal with that. I just move on. Uh, give, me, give me rejoice always, right? That later on in the book. But anyway, work it out with fear and trembling. These are awesome words. Listen, and they help us understand what Paul's saying here and in the verses that follow. He says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Fear, it's the word phobos. In the Greek, it's the word we get our word phobia from. And it can mean to just kind of be afraid, but, but it also carries, and it's, this is the way Paul's using it here, it also carries the meaning of reverence and awe. In Philippians chapter 2, phobos isn't implying uh, a, a terror of punishment, but rather a profound uh, respect and reverence of God. It reflects a serious acknowledgement of God's holiness and the weight of our responsibility to live in a way that honors Him. That's a mouthful, isn't it? That's what it means to be phobos of, of God, to, to work out your salvation with fear, to be aware. I serve a holy God, and He has called me He's given me everything I need, but he's called me to engage. He's called me to be intentional about choosing him every day, about taking up my cross every day, about saying, Lord, I don't just want to know about you. I want to live for you. I want this, these things that I know to be true in my heart about who you are to be manifest in the way I walk and talk and my attitude and my service and my righteousness in terms of my living and my lifestyle. I want to, to, to be all in. The next word is trembling. What a word. Traumas is the word. Um, and it conveys a physical sense of shaking and quivering. When's the last time you became so powerfully, overwhelmingly aware of the holiness of God that you shook? That's what Paul's saying here. That we, we are so powerfully, palpably aware of the holy God that we serve, that we serve him with trembling. And it's not just a, a scared to death trembling, it's an awe. It's, it's an overwhelming, just blown awayness, <laughs> if you will. Combined with this, this trembling word, combined with phobos or fear, um, suggests a sense of solemn awareness of God's greatness power, and majesty. It signifies an intense humility before God, recognizing our dependence on Him as we work out our salvation. There is a genuine... See, this is, this is really and truly getting to the heart of what it means to say that Christianity is not a religion. A religion is you doing your best to impress God. That ain't going to work. It's a relationship where you choose Christ and He chooses you. And you, you, you step in and abide in Him and He chooses to move in and abide in you. And you choose to take up your cross and follow Him and He fills you with His power to do it. Yes, God, I'm all in because I know you're all in, and together we're going to move in this process of growing up in Jesus. It's awesome. You can't outgive God. You, 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 any, he's already way down the road in terms of surrender. He gave it all. Okay, But every time you surrender, God's going to meet you there and take you higher. It's awesome. So then, now that we kind of get this fear and trembling the power of those words. Now, verses 13 through 16 make even more sense. For it is God who works in you 
to will and to act in order, uh, in order to fulfill his good purpose, to live. He, he gives you the power. He gives you the desire to do what pleases him, another translation says. Uh, do everything without grumbling or arguing. Man, that's another one that really nails me every time I read it. <laughs> this is what God wants for us. Do everything without grumbling or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure children of God without fault in a <laughs> warped and crooked generation. Does that sound like it kind of applies to today? The Bible never goes out of style. Then, then this is, and this is where I got the, the title for the message. Then you will shine among them, that is, the world, those who do not know Christ, like stars in the sky. And listen, if you grew up in the city, you have no clue what Paul's talking about here. Unless you've been out in the middle of nowhere where there's no man-made light, and you've looked up on a clear night, and you've seen the, the just explosion of stars and how bright they are, and how beautiful and magnificent they are. That's what Paul's talking about here. Okay, he wrote this before streetlights. <laughs> and so he said, look, that's you. As you live for Jesus in this warped generation, you're going to stand out like beautiful stars. And I really believe that Paul was also connecting with that, that the people used stars to navigate. They knew where stars were and they gave them signs as to how to move through life and where to go and how to get to that city. I follow that star and move over this way. You're going to be people that point the direction for people. It's awesome. And this, so you're going to be an all-star, if you will, <laughs> for Jesus. Um, as you hold firmly to the word of life, Jesus is the word. And his, his scriptures are the, 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 the written word. And as my grandma always taught me, the written word, bratty boy, leads you to the living word. And so as you hold firmly to that, and Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, as you hold firmly to Christ in every way, you're going to be a star that shines for the Lord. And this is, this is all kind of dependent on a desire to say, Lord, I'm all in. I'm all in. I'm all yours. James chapter 1, verse 22. James says, do not merely listen to the word. Um, I looked this word up and spent a little time with this whole listen. It, James is using a word here that, that people would use like saying, oh, I'm going to go to the community center today and hear a lecture. Right? You want to hear someone speak on a topic. Oh, that was a nice speech. <laughs> you know, I, I listened. I heard words. It was cool. It was nice. Whatever. But it doesn't have, you have no intent of it actually impacting your life or changing the way you live. And that's what Luke, Luke or not Luke, but James is saying, don't do that with the Word of God. Just, don't just merely listen to the Word and so deceive yourselves. It's a warning. It's a warning. James is saying, look, I, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to teach you something about human nature. We're good at deceiving ourselves into thinking that, hey, I've learned a lot of stuff. I have, I have a lot of head knowledge. And we can begin to deceive ourselves into thinking that knowing a lot about Jesus is the same as following Jesus. And it's not. Listen, I could study and, and, and I could write a great paper about a combustion engine. And I would understand it theoretically, how that engine works. But don't ever hand me an, a, a wrench and tell me to fix your car. <laughs> not if you want to drive it. I'll destroy it because there's this massive gap between theoretical information and living it out, right? And that's the call, and that's what James is calling us to. He, he says another place in, in James, he says in chapter 2, verse 19, even the demons believe and shudder, even the demons. Do you know, I don't think this is controversial to say, I, in many ways the demons know more about Jesus than, than we do. In the sense that these are among the, the demons are those angels who were in heaven and who were cast down when Satan rebelled. A third of the angels were cast down with him. They've seen him face to face. But you know what demons don't do? They don't repent. They don't trust. They don't obey. They don't surrender. They don't acknowledge him as Lord. 
And so James says, don't, don't just say you believe this stuff, but surrender and do those things. So, so, so James, what, what's the solution in, uh, in James's very rubber meets the road simple answer? He says, do what it says. I mean, I know that's simplistic, but that's kind of James. Don't just listen to the word. Do what it says. Carry it. Carry your theory over to the game. Live it out. And please, I, I really want to be sure and, and say, that James is not, and some people have accused him of this, but he's not preaching a works salvation. Oh, you got to do all. We're not saved by works, but we are saved unto them. We are saved unto a righteous life. We are saved unto a life of obedience, of, of following Jesus. And this is what James is getting at. He's saying, go all in. Go all in with your devotion and say yes to everything that the Lord's calling you to, and he'll help you and meet you halfway and help you grow in that. Jesus is Lord. Now, I want to take what we've said in all of this this morning and bring it down to four verses of Scripture. I've read these verses, all of them, many, many times, but for some reason the Lord brought them together for me as a way to end this message because they all encourage us and help us to see beautiful ways that God is involved in this with us as believers. Listen to these four verses. Philippians chapter 1, verse 6. Paul, writing to Christians, says, being confident of this, that he, God, who began a good work in you. Believers, when you stepped into this life of denying yourself, taking up your cross, and following Jesus, he who began that good work in you, he will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Now listen, this is why all of our testimonies have a chapter in them that says something like, I'm not who I used to be, praise God, even though I know I'm not all that I should be. Because we're somewhere on that journey. We're not finished. We're not a, is anybody a finished product? No. But praise God, we're not who we used to be. We've been born anew and we're on a journey and God is working in us and we're aware of that work that the, as the Holy Spirit convicts and leads and prods and inspires and, 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 and offers grace when we stumble and fall down and picks us back up and he's working and it's all about making us more like Jesus. Okay, so that's the first verse. God started work and he's going to carry it on to completion by the way, you know when it ends? <laughs> when the trumpet sounds, the sky splits, dead in Christ arise and, all, arise, and all of a sudden, the mortality gives way to immortality. And we're given a glorified body. Ching! And if you're alive, wow, you just get to feel the exhilaration of being changed in that moment. But if you're not, you'll be raised immortal. Like Jesus, we will all be made like him and be with him forever. Awesome. So he's going to bring it to completion. Now, the next verse, i got to kind of add a little uh, comment here. It's, it's the wrong passage, okay? Uh, I, I don't know how. I, I went over this with Kara, and, and I missed it by one verse, okay? <laughs> I've had a lot of my brain here lately. But anyway, it's not uh, Philippians 2.12. It's Philippians 2.13. So write that down. And this is the verse where, and I'll just paraphrase this, but this is the verse where Paul assures us that God is working in you, giving you the power and the desire to do what pleases him. That's the New Living version of that, okay? He gives you. You need power to, to serve the Lord? Amen. Do you have enough on your own? Uh-uh. Does God's, God gives it to you. Do you need desire? To serve the Lord, does your flesh sometimes say, mm, don't really want to do that today? Of course. But God will give you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. He's at work doing that. Isn't that awesome? Okay, third verse. Romans chapter 8, verses 28 and 29. Another one of those verses we, we, we know and love. And we know. We're not guessing. It's not speculative. We know that in all things, I don't know what you're going through right now, but it fits into all things, okay? God in all things works. He's active for the good, and he'll tell us what good is here in just a moment. For the good of those who love him. I, can't, I, I never can read that without making this comment. Love is a verb. Love is a verb. Love is a verb. Love is a verb. 
He's not saying those who have warm, gushy, nice, sweet feelings toward God. No. Those who love him with their heart, all their heart, with all their strength, with all their mind, with their life. They love him in this all-in devoted disciple, deny yourself, take up your cross and follow him way. God is at work with those who are in that process of loving him um, and who have been called according to his purpose. And then he tells us what that purpose is. For those God foreknew, he also predestined uh, them to be conformed into the image of his son. That's the journey we're on. That's spiritual growth. The convictions that God brings into our life to say goodbye to that or to step into this. The grace that God gives us to sustain us and teach us and shape us as we go through that valley. The truths that God brings to our mind as we sit in a study and hear something and all of a sudden something starts to stir in our heart that we hadn't seen before and we go, I need to take a step of obedience in that area of my life. Or all of those things. God is working in the mountaintops and the valleys shaping us, making us more like Jesus. From glory to glory to glory to glory to glory. So that, and I love how this ends, or this, this, this particular verse ends, um, his son, that he may be, Jesus, that he may be, or might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. Do you know what this is saying? God is making a family. And when we step into that new creation in eternity, future, with the family of God, we will literally all be part of the family of God. And I don't even know what that's going to totally be like. It's just, I know it's going to be awesome. And Jesus is our elder brother, and God is our father. And so he's making us like him in our character, in our devotion, in our purity. It's awesome. And then the last verse. Psalm 139, verse 5. David says, You hem me in, behind and before. You're running ahead of me. You're watching, you're leading the way, like a good shepherd would. You're taking up the rear. I don't know if you ever noticed that when you read through the book of Exodus, the pillar of fire, the pillar of fire or the pillar of cloud by day would lead. And there were times when enemies came and the pillar of fire would move from the front to the back between Israel and her enemies to protect them. You hem me in, you protect me in the front and the rear, and your hand is upon me. You lead me in paths of righteousness for your name's sake, the the psalm says, Psalm 23. So, as you engage in this fleshing out of your salvation, going all in, here's what you can know. Fill these blanks in. God is at work in you. His Spirit is at work in you. Moving, leading, prompting, calling, challenging, protecting, inspiring. With you, never, never, listen, we don't always feel God. You may be in a season where you're like, I just don't feel his presence. Know that you know that you know that you know that it's not based on feelings. He is with you. He is with you. He is working in that situation. And he is working around you. In all, every circumstance, he is at work for your eternal good and for his eternal purpose and glory. Fantastic. I hope you know that today. I'm excited about walking through this, this series, learning about going all in. Let me ask you today, are you all in with Jesus? It, did, did something come up? in this, this message that prompted your heart? Did the Holy Spirit begin to speak? So you know what? I, I need to take a step there. I need, to, I need to take out my cross afresh. That daily thing really got me. <laughs> you know? I don't know. But I encourage you to say yes to the Lord wherever he's calling you to take a step today. And let's go all in for the Lord. Maybe today you just need to come and say, there's just things going on in my life I need to pray about. I always say this, and I, I, I hope I'll never forget to, but we're going to take communion here in just a moment, and after that, as, after we're dismissed, I'll be down here, and this is your invitation to come and pray 
and take whatever step you need to take. Say yes to Jesus. Maybe, maybe, maybe the Lord is laying on your heart. Hey, let's take that step of baptism. Let's take that step uh, in your following me. Maybe it's, you know what, I, I, I need to surrender afresh or whatever it is. I just pray you'll say yes to him. Let's bow our heads and pray. Father, thank you for every day. Thank you for this day. Thank you for this opportunity to gather again with your people. Thank you for this week upcoming and uh, all the ways we're going to get to trust and follow you and call on your name and and I pray that we'll be able to be stars that shine in the heaven, examples for many around us as we trust you and follow you as we live our lives this week all in for you. I pray for my friends who may need to take a step today. Help them to say yes. Help me to say yes. Help all of us too. We love you. And as we move toward communion today, oh man, help us to just truly see May the eyes of our heart, as, as Ashley mentioned as he was reading from Paul, may the eyes of our heart be open to really see how awesome your love is for us in this moment. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.